Thank you, Stephanie. Very nice. We will, we will finish our series, uh, this New Year's series called Time to Be Focused Today. And uh, we have, through the last weeks, talked about refocusing on our salvation, the security of it, how we get it, where it comes from. We talked about our calling to be the salt and light, salt of the earth, light of the world. Last week we talked about who we are, and we said we're earthen vessels, fragile clay pots, but we are filled with a magnificent treasure, and that treasure is the presence of Christ in our hearts. Today I want to talk to you about refocusing on God. And I want to read to you from uh, John's Gospel, one verse to begin this lesson. And John has finished his Gospel, it's in chapter 21, it's verse 25, and it's the very last thing he writes, the very last verse of that, that Gospel. And this is what he says. He said, Jesus also did many other things, things not written in this Gospel. If they were all written down, I suppose the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. Now, I chose that verse because I want to talk about refocusing on God. And any time you talk about God, you have to narrow the discussion because an infinite God would take an infinite time to explain and would be impossible to do so adequately. So I'm not near confident that I will be able to stand here and tell you all you need to know about God. So I've narrowed this discussion down to three things that I want us to focus on this morning just before we remember what Christ did through the communion. And the first thing, and if you have your notes and you want to write this, you can write it. The first thing to focus on is this. God is present. P-R-E-S-E-N-T. God is present. Meaning He is here. That's a biblical truth. And that presence <coughs> is a personal, loving presence. God is not an invisible force. In the 17th and 18th centuries, during the time that was known as the Age of Reason, there was a religious movement that came to be known as Deism. And if you remember from your U.S. history, they claimed that a number of our founding fathers were Deists. And what those folks in the Age of Reason in the 17th and 18th century what they believed was, they, they looked around the world and they saw all of creation and they reasoned in their mind, somebody must have made it. And so they said, we believe in a creator. But then they looked around the world and they saw other things and they said, but we really don't believe that he's still involved. He's not involved, nor does he interact with humans and they used an illustration of a watch. They said that God was like a watchmaker. He created the watch, he wound it up, he set it down, and he walked away. And so the belief was God was a force, but it was not personal. It's fairly common even today to hold to that sort of deism. It's not unusual to talk to people who say, well, I believe that God is a force. I believe in a God. I believe that, that God is a force. You know, statistics show us that in America, spirituality, people believing in the spiritual world, is, is probably higher percentage-wise than it's ever been. But those who go to church and believe in the God of the gospel are not as big as they once were. You see, they believe in something. They believe in a force. They just don't believe in a personal God. And as we refocus on God this morning, the first thing I want you to understand is that, that God is personal, and that's a foundational doctrine of our faith. We worship a personal God with whom we can have a close personal relationship. He is a God who loves us, and He proves that by being present in our lives. Jesus said in Matthew 28, verse 20, as Matthew closed his gospel, Jesus said in some of his last words in that gospel, be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of this age. I am with you always. And then in John chapter 14, 18, Jesus said, I will not abandon you as orphans. 
I am there. I will come to you. And then in Matthew chapter 18, 20, he said this, it's a promise to you and me. He said, for where two or three are gathered together as my followers, I am there among them. Do you know that according to what God said in Matthew 18, 20, that Jesus Christ is here this morning. And I wonder how many of us, maybe myself included, came to church this morning with the thought on our minds that we're going to worship a God who's going to be there. I'm not going into an empty building where a bunch of people are going to come and fill the pews and we're suddenly going to sing some songs and hear a guy talk for a while and we're going to go home and life is going to be the same. We have come here to be in the presence of Almighty God. And he says it's here. Now, do we always feel his presence? Do we always feel it? No. Do we sometimes wonder where God is? Especially when we're going through struggles in our life, do we sometimes say, God, where in the world did you go? Absolutely. Do we sometimes come to church and leave and, and feel like maybe we didn't experience God's presence? Sure, yes. Yeah. I'm sure that happened. I had a person who used to go to church here many years ago, who when they first quit coming, I went to visit them and and I said, I miss you. And they said, well, I'll tell you the truth. I didn't get anything out of it. And they never came back. They just left it. And I said, that's a shame because, you know, God was there when you were there. I know that happens. But just because I don't feel his presence today doesn't mean he isn't here. Now, I'll let you in a little secret. That I didn't tell this in the early service. But I don't know why God decides to just suddenly show you that he's there. I mean, he's always here, but sometimes he just shows you that he's here. Sometimes you just feel his presence. And sometimes when I'm preaching, I lose all of you because I'm in here, because I feel about his presence. And sometimes I'm preaching, and I'll go home, and I'll say, you know, I just read the notes today. But God is still here. See, my faith is in what the Bible teaches me. And the Bible tells me that when I come to church, that He is here. In those days when we feel His presence, boy, those are special times, aren't they? And I often say when we have one of those services where God not only touches me and touches a couple of you, but just kind of touches all of us, you know? Kind of like when we had our revival back in the fall. I say, man, I wish someone would have been here. Someone would need to be touched by God. They just weren't here. I'm sorry, they weren't here that day because He touched us all. One of those times when God touches us, that's life-changing. We need God's presence. We don't just want God's presence, we need it. I've always been fascinated by the book of Job. It's the oldest book in the, in the Bible, written first or anything else. As you know, the, the story of Job is they've been dealing with this question of suffering ever since the Bible began. Why does God let bad things happen? Why do we have to suffer? In that whole book, Job is arguing with God and he's praying to God and he's questioning God. Why do I have to suffer? And he says, God, you just let me see you. You just let me talk to you. You just let me come into your presence and I will put you on trial. I will hold your feet to the fire and you will tell me what's going on. And that goes on for 40, almost 40 chapters. And then suddenly, Job finds himself feeling the presence of God. And he has no more questions. And as a matter of fact, the Bible says that he fell on his knees and he said, I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance for questioning you. You see, he didn't have his questions answered, but he had God in his life. He had his presence on him, and that was all he needed. Having been in the presence of God, nothing else matters. For him and for us. We may not feel him at the moment, but we know he is with us. And even when we don't feel Him for the moment or understand Him, He is here. He is there when we hurt. And sometimes that's all we've got is His presence when we hurt. He is there when we celebrate. He is there when we're confused. He is there when we make mistakes and sin in His presence. He's there. And He's there when we do good. We can feel His presence when we worship and we should. We come to worship to experience His presence, don't we? 
We sometimes experience His presence when we read the scriptures and meditate on them. Have you ever read a scripture verse and all of a sudden you said, oh my, that's exactly what I needed to hear. We experience His presence when we help somebody in need. And we see how their life changes because we've helped them in God's name. We, when we accept help from somebody else, we feel His presence. When we hear a song, you ever feel God's presence when you hear a song? It was funny, last night I was filled with communion cups and I turned my phone on. I just said, play gospel music, and it did. And the first song we played was about the blood. And I said, oh, is that a coincidence? We feel His presence when we see a sunset. You come over here early enough in the morning, you won't see a sunset, but you'll see a sunrise. It comes up right over here. So more between 6.30 and 7 o'clock, depending on the time of year, that sun will peek up over that mountain and the first light will come through that door or those windows and you just say, whoa. How about when you hold a little baby or how about when you see a kid smile? <coughs> you see, we know we're being blessed. And if we learn to look for God's presence and learn to listen, we will begin to feel His presence more and more. Here's the thing. You don't have to chase God. You don't even have to search for God. You simply have to accept Him. Relax and receive Him. The Bible says, Be still and know that I am God. So often we get so busy we can't be still. And when we're not still, we can't hear His voice. We don't hear His voice, we don't know His presence. Be still and know that I am God. We don't like stillness, we don't like quietness. We want action, we want movement, we want celebration. God says, be still and listen, and I'll speak to you. Well, that leads me to the second thing I want to tell you about God. <coughs> Number two, He's not only present, He is persistent. We serve a God who is persistent, He is faithful. And I want to ask you something, aren't you glad God didn't give up on us? I certainly am. We give up on Him, but He never gives up on us. God is persistent. Don't ever think He's given up on you. 1 Peter 2, 9 says, The Lord does not delay His promise, as some understands delay, but is patient with you and me, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. You see, God wants a relationship with every person on the face of the planet. And He has been persistent through the ages to try to make that happen. At creation, God made everything perfect. And he placed the first human beings in that perfect environment. And he said to them, he said, you are invited to stay here with me forever and fellowship with me in the cool of the day forever and ever and ever. And in that perfect place, those humans, much like we would have done, said, I'd rather satisfy my appetite than to honor you. And they lost that presence of God for a while. Well, after that, God chose a nation. He chose the people. He chose the Hebrews. And then he gave them the law. And God said to them, if you will follow this law, I will be your God and you shall be my people. And I will visit you in that temple in my Shekinah glory. But they didn't obey that law. They found it impossible to keep the law because we're not perfect creatures, we're flawed people infected with an old sin nature. And so they continually failed. And every time they failed, they lost the presence of God. But God wasn't finished yet. As we failed, He persisted. And then He sent us Jesus. Romans 5, 6 says, when we were utterly helpless. Christ came at just the right time and he died for us sinners. Verse 8 says that God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were sinners. Because you see in Romans 6, 23, he says the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. 10, 13 says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see the difference? He puts them in the garden and he says, you can stay here. Don't satisfy the appetite for that tree. And they said, I will eat. 
He says, okay, you got to go. Then he says, okay, here's the law. You keep the law. We are God. And he broke the law and he said, we'll be exiled. But God was persistent. He sent Jesus. And Jesus said, it's not up to you anymore. I will not leave you. I will not abandon you. I will not leave you orphans. I will be with you to the end of the age. Wherever you meet together, I will be there, whether you're there or not. See the difference? God's persistent. He hasn't let you go. He's not going to let you go. He wants each and every one of us to have that personal relationship, and He's reaching and searching for you and me today. And we already know him. He's, he's reaching for us to bring us closer. If we don't know him, he's reaching for us to bring him in. God is present. God is persistent. And the third thing I want you to know is that God is powerful. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. God is powerful. Ephesians 6.10, a final word, he says, Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Now, to say God is powerful is almost like a cliche, isn't it? We say that and we kind of say, eh, I knew that. I know I'm not giving you new information when I say that God is powerful. But I want you to think about that for a moment. 1 Corinthians 1.24 says, But to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God. 2 Timothy 1.7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power and love and self-discipline. Wow. We not only need His presence, we not only need for Him to be persistent in pursuing us, but we also need His power every day. I'm going to close here in just a second, but I want to focus on two specific powers of God that will lead us to the Lord's table, I hope. And the first thing I want to focus on is the power of the cross. We talk about God's power all day long and, and, and be accurate in so many things we could say, but the first thing as God's people we need to focus on is the power of the cross of Christ. Look at what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 1.18. He said, the message of the cross is foolish to those who do not believe, those who are headed for destruction, but we who are being saved, those of us who believe, it is the very power of God. What happened on the cross of Christ is indescribably powerful. We don't necessarily think of it as powerful. We, we sometimes think of it as God surrendering to weakness. God surrendered and became weak so that he could die. Otherwise he couldn't die. So that's what we think about. God surrendered to weakness. But the cross has power to bring us to God. But nothing else can do it. Hebrews says we come boldly to the throne of grace and that's because of the cross. The cross has the power to make peace between us and God. Colossians says he made peace with everything in heaven and earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. The cross has the power to cleanse us from all of our sins. The cross has the power to make me and you worthy to stand before God the Father one day. The cross has the power to change lives. Power of the cross. I want to read to you. And I'll do it quickly. Now this is again from that book that I told you about after Christmas that Jenny gave me called uh, Irresistible by Andy Stanley. And he's closing his book. It's called The Conclusion. It's a chapter. And he talks about going to Rome on vacation. And he goes to Rome and he visits the Roman Colosseum. And let me read you his description of that and, and in just a few things. And it won't take a minute, but I want, you to, I want you to start thinking about the power of the cross. He said the Roman Colosseum was original, originally known as the Flavian Amphitheater. Construction began in AD 70 during the reign of Emperor, Emperor Vespasian. It was completed in AD 80 by his son Titus. After Titus died, his brother Domitian became emperor and continued to add to structure. Listen to this. The Colosseum has four levels. It could seat or stand over 50,000 spectators. 50,000, that's a big football stadium. The floor was constructed of wood and was covered with fresh sand. And that fresh sand was continually brought in to cover the gore created by the games. You see, when they kill people, they bled on the sand and they clean it up. He writes, the floor rotted away centuries ago. 
Modern visitors to the Colosseum have a bird's eye view of some of the stone walls that supported that massive floor. These walls create a maze of passageways and windowless rooms. It was here in the dark, damp underworld of the Colosseum that wild animals and slaves and hunters and criminals gathered to await what might be their final moments in the sun or the sand of money. Spectators entered the Colosseum through 80 arched entrances, 80 doors. All the four were numbered. The four unnumbered entrances were the Emperor's Gate, reserved for the Emperor and his family, two VIP gates for special guests, and the Gladiator Gate. The Gladiator Gate is directly across the arena from the Emperor's Gate. When we visited Stanley Wright's guests were being ushered into the Colosseum through the Emperor's Gate. And it was there, just outside the Emperor's Gate, that I saw something from which I hope I never fully recover. As we waited outside for our tour guide to purchase our tickets, I couldn't help but reflect on what took place centuries ago, a few yards from where we were standing. For almost four centuries, the Roman Colosseum was a place where death and strength and brutality were celebrated. The Colosseum stands as a memorial to ancient Greece's lust for conquest and disregard for life. Specifically, the life of the weak and the conquered. Mercy was weakness. Good was what was good for Rome. Jupiter reigned and Rome was eternal. It is impossible for us to fathom the gore that covered the floor of this arena. They celebrated the opening of the Colosseum with a hundred days of games where over 5,000 animals were slaughtered to the bloodthirsty mob. The Colosseum was not the first Roman arena to decide for that kind of gore. It was all over the place, but it was also where Christians were fed to the lions. Where Christians were wrapped in animal skins and thrown to wild dogs. Where Nero would illuminate his gardens at night by burning the crosses of Christians who had been crucified during the day. Now listen to this, and it's about time. So with visions of gladiators, ravenous animals, and the roar of bloodthirsty mobs, I followed our guide through the turnstile into the shadow of the Colosseum. As we approached the Emperor's Gate, surrounded by hundreds of tourists with cameras, I looked up and saw the last thing I would, would have expected to see. Hanging in the archway of the Emperor's Gate was an enormous wooden cross. When I saw the cross in the Colosseum, I was overwhelmed with the realization that the cross is the power of God. The contrast was staggering. Here were two symbols representing two kingdoms, the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God. And in the end, the kingdom of God in Christ prevailed. The Roman Empire is no more. The Colosseum is a tourist attraction, a symbol that once represented the most horrible kind of death, now represents eternal life and represents it everywhere. Isn't that amazing? The power of the cross, the second thing is I want you to reflect on the power of the resurrection. Paul said in Philippians 3.10, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. The power that rose Christ from the dead, the power of the resurrection is the power that blesses us as we live this life. As we live this life, often walking within the valley of the 